on us. She won over the Conservative Party fateful. Now can Liz Truss win over the UK? We'll be asking about the challenges ahead for the prime minister in waiting, the one-time Remainer who played the hardline Brexiter in a sometimes bitter uh, Tory leadership contest. We'll ask about comparisons with Britain's first female prime minister, Margaret Thatcher, and the legacy of her predecessor, Boris Johnson, uh, leaves behind the uh, big majority that he won back in 2019 and the uh, lost credibility through uh, scandal and political infighting. Will he go away or will his shadow loom? Trust, like Thatcher, inherits a Britain in crisis with double-digit inflation and massive strikes. Will she make good on promises to uh, cut taxes and curb the power of trade unions more broadly? What next for post-Brexit Britain after... Uh, 12 years of Tory rule so far. Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at uh, the uh, uh, anointment of Liz Truss, which uh, is coming up uh, from uh, uh, Balmoral uh, on Tuesday. Joining us from Windsor, England, where it's not happening this time around, is uh, historian uh, Anthony Selden, author of The Impossible Office, The History of the British Prime Minister. Thank you for being with us. Nice to be here. Uh, joining us is from Birmingham, political theory researcher Jake Scott. Welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Catherine Fieschi is director of Counterpoint UK, which advocates for better representative democracy. Did I say that right? Well, why not? Yes. <laughs> and you're also the author of Populocracy, the Tyranny of Authenticity and the Rise of of populism. Yes, that's right. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. The France 24 debate where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Okay, it's not the margin first predicted. Still, Liz Truss garnering 57% of the vote, easily defeating former finance minister Richie Sunak to win the Conservative Party leadership. Nick Rushworth has more on a leader in waiting whose views uh, seem to evolve with the mood insider camp. Liz Truss steps centre stage, claiming to be the heir to Margaret Thatcher. That legacy involves curbing, if not slashing, trade union power and cutting taxes. I have a plan to make Britain a high-growth economy over the next 10 years, through bold supply-side reform. We will cut taxes, helping businesses invest in their future, we'll tackle the cost of energy and we'll control government spending. Truss has been the UK's foreign minister for the last three years. She made a series of controversial statements in that role, not least recently when asked about the French president. President Macron, friend or foe? The, the jury's out, but if I, if I... Ties with European neighbours were the undoing of Thatcher and have long been a source of tension in the Conservative Party. Truss voted to remain in the EU in 2016, but in this summer's leadership election, she we said she'd been wrong. To be frank. This lady is for you turning. The 47-year-old began her political life as a Liberal Democrat while studying at Oxford University and supported the legalization of cannabis and the abolition of the monarchy. She went on, however, to become a Tory MP. Truss held six ministerial portfolios under three prime ministers. She succeeds Boris Johnson with the UK struggling to find its path after a messy Brexit and a wave of strikes, double-digit inflation and the Labour Party ahead in the polls. Not unlike when Thatcher came to power decades ago. Jake Scott, uh, your thoughts on Liz Truss? How will she govern? Well, I think one thing that people regularly talk about with Liz Truss is her so-called conversion, as has just been mentioned, from being a Liberal Democrat to being a Conservative and being a Remainer to being a Brexiteer, neither of which I really believe is actually true. I think the transition from Liberal to Conservative is facilitated by the fact the Conservative Party is mostly full of Liberals. And I think the transition from Remainer to Brexiteer is irrelevant, given the fact that we voted to leave the European Union. In terms of her governing style, I don't necessarily have much hope. I think the way she approached the situation in Ukraine and was incredibly bullish with Putin is, is 
irresponsible to say the least. I think the comment she's made about our European friends and neighbours is not particularly nice and I also don't think that she's actually going to have much chance to get anything done. We've only got another 18 months of this parliament by which time we're probably going to be in, in even deeper of a crisis than we're in now. Not much time to get things done but she's got a big majority. And so did Boris Johnson, and nothing's happened over the last two years, three years. We've had we've had barely anything done. I appreciate there was a pandemic going on, but also there was very little done in terms of actual changes that people wanted to see, which you can do regardless of a pandemic, such as changes to the immigration system or actually getting Brexit finished. I mean, got Brexit started, the whole phrase, get Brexit done, it hasn't been done. It's been started. All right. Uh, let, let me get uh, your, your reaction, uh, Anthony Selden, because Liz Truss uh, has been a mainstay the last couple of years. To us on this side of the channel, she seems like an unknown quantity. When you as a biographer of so many British prime ministers, do prime ministers surprise when they come to office? Uh, by the way, I agree with uh, what was uh, everything that was been said so far. Well, I think above all, they surprise themselves. Uh, what they do and say before they become prime minister is very different to uh, what they do once they're in power. The qualities they need uh, to get into that office, like all uh, leadership offices in democracy, are very different from the strengths and qualities you need to be a good incumbent of that. Uh, office, and no one knows, not the least Liz Truss herself, how she'll perform in office. Nothing but nothing prepares you. She's the best prepared prime minister uh, for over 30 years since John Major in terms of experience, but nothing will prepare her for this, and some uh, step up uh, and, and others step down. Uh, in Boris's case, I think he stepped sideways, probably, uh, or maybe into a different parallel universe. <laughs> in a, into a different parallel universe, uh, Catherine Fieschi, uh, your your thoughts on this? It, it, what, what are you What are you expecting from Liz Truss? Well, I think I'm expecting um, first of all that she's going to appoint a cabinet. Um, full of people who are going to try and deliver on precisely what she's been promising. So I, do, I think that that's really important. Let's see who she puts in, in cabinet. Um, yeah, because she has, she has a choice here, right? It's either she doubles down with hardliners or she tries to open up more. My sense is that she's going to try and deliver by doubling down. Um, I think, you know, she's probably uh, going to opt for Quasi Quarteng uh, uh, as, as chancellor. And therefore, we're going to see somebody who's going to try and deliver the tax cuts that, that she's promised. I don't think that we're going to see uh, a U-turn on this. I also think that she's been extremely vague on a number of issues. So it's going to be hard to kind of get her to measure up to some of what she's promised. Yes, she's promised smaller government. Yes, she's promised uh, tax cuts. Um, but for the rest, particularly with respect to energy, we don't really know where she's going to go. One thing that's being suggested is that, you know, she may very well, you know, steal Labour's thunder and actually go uh, for, for a freeze on, on prices. But this is going to take her down a road where she would probably have to borrow more, which is going to put her on a collision course with some of the members of her party. And we'll talk more about uh, uh, those hard choices she faces when it comes to the current energy crunch and double-digit inflation. Uh, you heard uh, in that report that clip of Liz Truss on the campaign trail saying the jury's still out over whether or not Emmanuel Macron is a friend or a foe. The French president earlier reacting to uh, her win as a Tory leader. D'abord, je dis bienvenue à Listros, je lui exprime toutes les félicitations de la France et euh, nous sommes à disposition pour pouvoir travailler entre, comme on dirait, alliés et amis. Work together as allies and friends. When you, when you listen to him speaking there, uh, Catherine, do you get the sense that you know, he understood Macron, this was all just a bit of campaign bluster? 
No, I, I think I think he knows that this wasn't strictly campaign bluster. Um, I think he knows that to some extent she's a prisoner of of the party, much uh, as her predecessors were. Um, I think he knows that there's going to be a long, hard road ahead in terms of negotiating uh, uh, around the Northern Ireland uh, protocol. And I think that things are going to get very, very rough between uh, between both the EU and, uh, and, and, and Britain. So I think all this kind of hope that she's going to turn, she's going to soften, she's going to reach out, she's going to be inclusive. Um, she may well have to do some of that, you know, six months from now. But the fact is that in the meantime, she's going to try to be hardline and she's going to inflict quite a lot of damage to a number of relationships. Uh, Jake Scott, uh, you hear uh, Catherine Fieschi talk about uh, uh, Liz Truss being beholden or a prisoner, was I think the word you used, to uh, her party. Uh, do you agree with that? Yes, I think that she's going to... There, there was a really good article that came out on this by Lord Justice Sumption a few days ago that basically pointed out that the, the vast majority of the Tory party membership is not in touch with the rest of the, the electorate. And, and she knows they put her there. And she's going to be very cautious as to how she's treated or how she treats uh, the, the Tory party over the next 18 months. But also the MPs, as you can see, they turn on people very quickly. That's one thing the Tory party does very well is hold on to power. Boris Johnson, as you say, delivered the largest majority since Margaret Thatcher out in weeks, largely because of internal party scandals, not because of policy failure. So I don't necessarily think Truss is in a strong position. I'd actually really agree that, that she's in quite a weak position and knows it. In, in a weak position, uh, Anthony Selden, uh, is it now standard for most uh, British prime ministers to be in a weak position? Well, um, Prime Ministers fail. Uh, she will fail. Her tears of joy today will become tears of bitterness and recrimination and, and sadness. Uh, the only question is when. Uh, will that be after a coup against her, uh, after a policy failure on the economy or after a general election defeat? I mean, she had, look, she has a lot of the qualities you need, including... Uh, extraordinary self-confidence uh, and youthfulness and energy uh, and optimism. Uh, she's also true. She's experienced. Um, uh, these things count. Uh, but as you've been hearing, counting against her is the fact that she can shoot from the hip. Uh, and that's not clever. Um, uh, that, that isn't sensible. That's not what good prime ministers, good leaders do. Uh, and she is facing an appalling party position. I mean, no party since the birth of democracy in Britain um, in 1832, a uh, slow process, uh, we're still working towards it, um, has won five elections on the trot. Uh, and she has a divided party in the country, divided not least over, over, over Europe and how to treat Europe, uh, but a very divided party over uh, how to deal with the, the, the huge crises she has over fuel prices, cost of living, inflation, employment, productivity, union strikes, uh, a lot of those familiar in France. Um, it's going to be very tough for her, uh, but I think we'd be foolish to, to write her off. Um, but look, every prime minister since 1918 has had to leave. That's when Britain became more fully a democracy. Um, every prime minister since then has had to leave Downing Street uh, at moments not of their ideal choosing because of ill health, because they've been rejected, because of coups, uh, policy failures. Um, you know, it's hard to, to, to think that something isn't going to get her down. Um, it's yeah. a tough job. I mean, as I argue, it's, that it's a tough job and it, it, it requires yeah, a certain It's not impossible. It's not impossible, as I argued in that book, Impossible Office, but the way they choose to do it makes it pretty much impossible. And you don't want to take over at the end of a long period of one party rule. Uh, you want to take over at the beginning, uh, like, for example, Thatcher did and, and Blair did and Clement Attlee, who've been our most successful prime ministers since the war. Right. You want to take over at the end of the uh, beginning of a cycle, not the end of a cycle. Uh, her character oh, will matter when it comes to, again, what we were talking about earlier with uh, uh, Catherine Fieschi, which is whether she uh, decides to uh, double down with uh, the core of the Conservative Party electorate or reach out. Uh, 
Um, and we saw that uh, Boris Johnson, where he succeeded in 2019, was breaking uh, uh, Labour's uh, strongholds in the north, the so-called Red Wall. Now, on the campaign trail of her education, the working class northern city of Leeds, Liz Truss claimed, quote, many of the children I was at school with were let down by expectations, poor educational standards and a lack of opportunity. Well, here you can see the plush grounds of the Round Hay School. And over there, well, they're less than impressed with their former alumna. I'm not sure she's very trustworthy, to be fair, either. Some of the stuff she said about Round Hay School and things like that is it's not true, in my opinion. Um, I was only a couple of years below her at school, so I was there at the same time. Um, and it wasn't a, a bad school. Yeah, so, so character matters. And yet... Uh, Jake Scott, you could also make the argument that uh, despite what she said, she still won and she's the prime minister now. Absolutely. But again, I think that speaks to the level of disconnect between the Tory party and the rest of the country. And don't get me wrong, I am a Conservative Party member, but the, the majority of people in the Conservative Party are not representative of the majority of people in the country. And one thing that Boris Johnson got absolutely right in terms of policy agenda was the levelling up programme. And I'm not sure how committed Liz Truss is to that. Let's talk about levelling up. Uh, it, it's a statement that uh, he used again in that tweet uh, that he did earlier uh, to uh, congratulate uh, the, the, the prime minister, uh, the incoming his successor. Um, he invited her to pursue the policy of levelling up. Explain for our viewers what levelling up means. I would struggle. That's the problem. I don't think there is a clear agenda of what actually levelling up means. I, I think it's a lot of hot air. I think it's a lot of talking about, you know, notional aspects of scattering government departments across the country and, and maybe talking occasionally about spending a little bit more money on education. But frankly, it's tinkering with the issue and, and not getting to the heart of it, which is our economy has always been London focused always yeah uh, apart from maybe a brief period in in the beginning of the 20th century when it was coal centered and even then it was probably about 40 percent london focused so th this is not a structural change and it needs to be uh, and and that's you know th there's also the problem of the fact that our constitution has been vandalized under the blairite years and there's and no conservative government has ever done anything to actually reverse that despite what do you what do you mean by vandalized years. Well, things like the, uh, the the removal of the law lords and the creation of the Supreme Court, which is a nonsense name because Parliament is supreme. Um, things like the Equality Act, which admittedly Liz Truss has said that she wants to review, but every other candidate in this, every other serious candidate in the race was dead against. Uh, things like the Communications Act 2003, the series a devolution for one thing, that needs to be seriously addressed because all it's doing is entrenching further division in our nation as opposed to solving it. Is 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 Britain's uh, increasing polarization, and we saw it with sometimes fatal consequences during the referendum campaign uh, for Brexit. Is that something that's inevitable, or is that something that can be reversed? No, Catherine Fieschi. No, I think I think um, polarization can be reversed. I think you know it's a it's a long project. You have to decide to do it. Um, but I just want to intervene just very quickly on the leveling up uh, agenda, which is that, you know, even though it is hazy, um, in it, even in its haziest form, everyone knows that leveling up depends on a form of uh, different forms of redistribution, redistribution of power, redistribution of funds. And, you know, quite frankly, um, Liz Truss is very much against any kind of form of redistribution. Um, you know, she's she's gone on record. She doesn't believe that, you know, power belongs in the hands of the people. But at the same time, she's also gone on on, on record in terms of proposed tax cuts, you know, against uh, financial and economic redistribution. So in, in, in every respect, even though it's a hazy agenda, the fact is that right now, I think it's dead in the water. Uh, Anthony Selden, whether you're in Britain, whether you're in France, whether you're in uh, the, 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 the United States, uh, Politicians have two ways to power. They either try to energize their base as much as possible or they try to build coalitions. This talk about leveling up and the fact that we're not quite sure uh, what it means. We, but we do know okay. that it has to do with, again, try, Boris Johnson trying to reach out beyond his core oh. Brexit constituency. 
okay, I mean, there's one thing that she cares about, uh, which is the same thing as all prime ministers care about, which is winning their own general election. They want their own mandate. She, at the moment, is living under the manifesto of her predecessor, Boris Johnson, and the MPs uh, were elected because of his charisma, but also because they're getting Brexit done in 2019, and uh, they're up against a very weak um, and highly ideological uh, Labour leader. So she wants to get her own manifesto with her own policies, and everything she's going to be doing is to try and guarantee that. And she's a highly, highly ambitious person. You can hear that, the way she always talks about I, I and me all the time. She's going to have to correct that. Uh, so that's uh, what she's going to want to do. So she'll do anything that she can to ensure that she builds up um, enough uh, support across the country, which is going to be extraordinarily difficult, as we were saying earlier, to get her own general election victory. When it will never be as big as Boris Johnson's, but it, if she can get 20, 30 majority, uh, that will do her. Um, Levelling up, you know, Britain is not, look, Britain is not France. So I mean, Britain is incredibly lopsided, has been ever since the Industrial Revolution petered out. It is London, it's the South East. Uh, it, it's absurd uh, uh, when French people come across to recognise how lopsided it is. It isn't a bit like France. Of course, France has its left behind areas. Last summer, I was walking from Switzerland to the North Sea uh, along the North uh, France belt uh, for, for a book I'm writing on on the Western Front way, trying to open up the, the French economy in the north uh, of the country, all the way along uh, that belt from uh, the Vosges uh, through Nancy uh, uh, and, and up through Verdun, uh, to, to, uh, up through Arras and to the sea. I mean, you know, but, but for all that, it, it is incredibly, uh, the UK, incredibly lopsided. But for the reasons that you've heard both speakers say, it's not really a Tory thing. And the only way that you can address that is by heavy government intervention and spending, which, by the way, repeatedly hasn't worked. It's a chronic problem. And that's not what Liz Truss is going to be about. But, last point, but given that she wants to win her own mandate, she might have to do enough to make those areas, uh, some of which will need to vote from her, in those unleveled up areas. Um, otherwise, she's not going to win. She won't get a majority. Yeah, one of the big questions. And as you said earlier, by the way, prime ministers come and go. We have the evidence uh, uh, by the removal vans that were spotted last week at uh, number 10 uh, <laughs> Downing Street. But the so undignified. It's yeah. so humiliating. It, it is. But uh, uh, Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson, his legacy could well be one of bravado and bluster, sure. Uh, uh, but uh, she's going to have to uh, see whether or not she can step out of his shadow. Uh, her predecessor, a journalist come politician who waited till the 11th hour before choosing his camp in the Brexit campaign and then toured around in that red bus that uh, advertised the exaggerated claim that EU funds would instead go to the National Health Service. Uh, the Johnson style of leadership, before, we go, before he goes, let's just remind people, uh, plenty of uh, lovable rogue improvisations and photo ops in hard hats like these images last week at a Suffolk nuclear power plant. And even after Partygate, the quips kept coming. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. There's an entertainment factor, Anthony Selden, in politics. And uh, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, he may be run out of town on a rail, as you previously uh, uh, explained, uh, but he's entertaining. Will how does Liz Truss step out of his shadow? Well, she's not funny, is she? Um, um, Emmanuel Macron, I think, would be better if he was more entertaining and, and had more of that good-natured goodwill about him. I mean, look, that was Boris Johnson's greatest asset. He was great bringing people together. Uh, he was great attacking common enemies, whether the EU or... Uh, Russia, but he he was not good at all at, at, at building um, and making positive uh, things happen. Uh, Liz Truss will suffer in the same way John Major did after um, Thatcher, who was charismatic, or Gordon Brown after the charismatic Tony Blair. Um, you know, she's a serious uh, person, 
Um, and she doesn't do jokes. She, she doesn't have that same great goodwill factor. And Boris Johnson could be very irritating and damaging to her. Uh, and she's going to try and keep in with him. We have two very powerful newspaper groups in the UK, the Daily the Telegraph group and the Daily Mail group. Uh, they're going to be massively important in the next uh, general election. They are on the um, anti-EU, pro-Brexit, uh, pro-small state, pro-small tax uh, side. Uh, she's going to have to dance very close to them. But if she dances too close, she'll lose her own centre left. I mean, I look, I agree with both the commentators. Um, so that's not much of a debate, is it? Because we're kind of agreeing. <laughs> it is incredibly difficult. I mean, why has the Queen said to Boris Johnson, uh, which, by the way, he should never have said, because you should never, ever repeat what the Queen says. But she said to him, why on earth does anyone want your job? Uh, when she offered him the job. Or that's what Boris Johnson said that she said, but you've always got to take uh, <laughs> slightly with a pinch of salt anything he says. Uh, do you agree, Jake Scott, that uh, Liz Truss is going to have a hard time stepping out of uh, Boris Johnson's shadow, especially if um, he starts commenting? <laughs> well, I think there's only... I think there's only one point that I would disagree on. I'd, I'd say that Liz Truss is quite funny, but probably not for the reasons that she wants. Uh, the, the, the speech she gave when she took the position was laughable and 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 quite clearly so in the delivery and the reception. But yes, I think the problem is Boris Johnson's going to cause a lot of problems for uh, for for Liz Truss. Let's not forget he's still an MP. He's still going to be on the back benches. She's probably not going to be brave enough to give him a cabinet position. Uh, and we saw how inconvenient Theresa May was for Boris Johnson as a leader, not by any by any any comparison, but that just goes to show how much Boris Johnson is going to be a problem for, Therese, for, for Liz Truss. And I, I keep saying Theresa May because in my mind, Liz Truss might be trying to emulate Margaret Thatcher, but she's going to come off like Theresa May. She's going to come off wooden, impersonable, you know, passionless. I mean, there's there's certain things. I, I, again, Liz Truss might surprise us in terms of her technical proficiency, but in terms of her just sheer likability or lack thereof as a politician, you can't get around that. And as much as um, uh, as much as manifestos matter in elections, leaders matter just as much. And if if she doesn't have the ability to energize even a room of party loyalists, I can't see her energizing 30 million people. You agree with that, Katzenfiski, that today's world, a leader can't always be on message. Uh, they have to, to show a bit of fire in the belly when they're speaking. I, I think they do. Um, there's, I think one of the things that we're about to see is something quite interesting. We're going to see the UK move from one form of populism light to a different form of populism light. So, I mean, I would say that, you know, what we got with Boris Johnson was something that I've, you know, I've written about elsewhere, you know, the, the kind of the authentic guy. You know, what you see is what you get, warts and all, I can't comb my hair, I get things wrong, I slip up, aren't I endearing? Um, you know, basically the, the, the subtext is, look, I'm not better than you, I'm kind of just like you, right? And, and this is something that is quite powerful uh, in politics and particularly at a moment where people are feeling slightly lost and and, uh, and need somehow to 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 hang on to to the norms and, and and the values and the ideas and images they have, I think what we're about to see is a move to to something else. And it's interesting that you know we we've talked a, a, a little bit about how she's trying to get out from under Boris Johnson's shadow. She has very explicitly, as we all know, chosen to walk in Margaret Thatcher's footsteps. You know, these are very large footsteps, and I'm not entirely sure she can fill the shoes or the footsteps, for that matter. But I think that one of the things that that's interesting is that we're going to see another version that we saw shades of in in Margaret Thatcher, which is somebody who is very defiant about the establishment, which is going to be very different from 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 Johnson. I think you know I think one of the one of the hallmarks of of Liz Truss that appeals to some of the conservative membership is the fact that she's she's headstrong. She's willing to say so what. She's willing to to take on you know the received wisdom. And there is something there that is reminiscent a little bit uh, of Margaret Thatcher. But but Margaret Thatcher was much more pragmatic. She was the grocer's daughter from Lincoln. She had a a chemistry degree. What we have here is a kind of 
uh, an emulation, um, but definitely trying to sort of move away from the pure image, the kind of the hologram prime minister, to somebody who is a little bit more down to earth, pragmatic, not terribly exciting, but gets the job done. Now, now you, you, the, it's hard not to make these comparisons to Margaret Thatcher in particular because of the strikes this past summer. It's been branded by some newspapers as a summer of discontent in the UK, a nod to what was known as the winter of discontent in 1979, high inflation and industrial uh, uh, action swept labor from power and ushered in a landslide win for Margaret Thatcher. Um, however, uh, Catherine Fiesier, again, it's this, uh, you want to be there at the end of beginning of a cycle, not the end of a cycle. It was Thatcher replacing a Labour prime minister, not the case now where uh, Liz Truss is replacing a fellow Conservative. That's absolutely right. And also, I think that, you know, one of the key things that um, Liz Truss is going to have to reckon with is the fact that I don't think that aside from the 50,000 people who, uh, or 60,000 people in the end, who voted for her out of the Conservative party members, I don't think that there is an appetite for small state or for lack of state intervention at this point, you know, given the state of the UK economy, given the state, um, you know, of the of the of the energy crisis. This is no time, I think, to come in and say, we're going to pull back. My feeling is that contrary to 1979, you know, there is probably a demand for more state intervention. And Boris Johnson actually knew this. Um, you know, he was cack handed about it and, and hamstrung by 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 the very same Conservative Party. But I do think that, you know, this the, the big difference is that not it's not just that she's not coming in at the beginning of a cycle. She's coming in at a moment where I think, you know, arguing for a small state, no state intervention is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. I want to pick up on that point. But first, let me ask Anthony Selden, uh, it, it, how much does 2022 right now look like 1979 where you are? Anthony Selden, can you hear us? I seem to have lost the connection there with Anthony Selden. I'll put the question to you, uh, uh, Jake Scott, uh, even though you seem to be ridiculously young <laughs> and not like me who can remember 1979, or can you? I don't know. But is that a fair comparison? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult, but I'll take it as a compliment. Um, no, I think... Uh, Again, my my parents tell me stories about, about 1979 and the and the 1970s in general, and just how poor things were, and how much of a system collapse it was. Not just a, a government collapse, a system collapse. But I think, if if I may, I, I'd like to disagree with Catherine just just a little bit. There's two things that I think need to be borne in mind, or actually three things, really. The first is Margaret Thatcher's greatest electoral victory was not 1979, but 1983. And that's because in that four years, she was actually quite cautious for the beginning of it. And then the privatization program started ramping up from about the beginning of the 80s, not, not from 1979. Mm. So the second thing that I would, um, well, that was the second thing. The third thing that I would like to just kind of make a point on is that that, that in many ways, Margaret Thatcher and Liz Truss are similar in that they are, they were, well, Margaret Thatcher definitely was quite resistant to the voices saying, you need to stop doing this. And she said, no, I know what I'm doing. And she pushed it through and it worked. And, and in terms of, you know, actually achieving a program, whether or not it worked historically is a different debate, but in terms of achieving a program, it worked. Um, Liz Truss, is not Margaret Thatcher. She doesn't have the the charisma. She doesn't have the presence. She doesn't have. I, I mean, I can't speak to her work ethic. I mean, Margaret Thatcher's was just ridiculous. But I can't speak to her work ethic. But she's not Margaret Thatcher, and she, I can't see her standing up to a party. And again, I have to come back to my my point at the beginning of the show, which is there's only 18 months left. There's not four years left. How on earth in 18 months is she going to make any meaningful change that then the the, the electorate, which admittedly is always against the government halfway through its term, but how is that going to bring the electorate back to the party? And I, I don't think it will. I, I do agree with Catherine in, in that this is not 1979. This is not a period when swinging tax cuts and privatisation can be pursued, largely because we've, we've basically already cut privatisation as far we, as... But Jake, we, we, we saw Kwesi Karteng, who is the uh, uh, finance minister-in-waiting pen a piece in the Financial Times, where and, and we heard Liz Truss again say it today that... Are those tax those tax cuts are coming. 
But again, that probably marks a difference between Margaret Thatcher and Liz Truss, because Thatcher er eroded cabinet responsibility, whereas Truss will have to rely very strongly on her cabinet and cabinet uniformity. So perhaps, yes, they probably will come. I don't necessarily think that's what the people want right now. And again, maybe it's what the people need. You know, Margaret Thatcher was always quite clear that, you know, the medicine might hurt, but it will save the patient. Um, but nonetheless, I think that this is going to be a different style of government to Thatcher. So I, I don't necessarily see the utility of comparison beyond the points that we've made so far. Anthony Selden is back with us. Anthony, uh, again, let's go beyond just the individuals here. How much for you does 1979 resemble 2022? Uh, well, it certainly resembles it in that I had a power cut just then, uh, and that explained uh, uh, why I disappeared, <laughs> but I'm, I'm now uh, back. I, I mean, Everything in history is always um, different, and it's also often the same. And um, uh, but uh, uh, the I think the challenge, I think the risk for uh, her will be to try to emulate Thatcher and the Thatcher predicament in uh, seventy nine or eighty three too much. I mean, she is not Margaret Thatcher. The only way that she'll succeed is not by trying to emulate. Thatcher and distance herself from Theresa May, but it will be by being Liz Truss and finding her own authentic voice. It's one of the ten iron laws uh, of being a prime minister, which I was writing about this week. If you don't find your authentic voice, uh, and I'm not certain she has it yet, um, it won't uh, work. So she's very narked by the Thatcher comparisons. Um, so I, I think, you know, we should move on from, from 79. We should be talking about 2022. Uh, I, I, it's hard to think of such a difficult inheritance economically, socially and politically. Uh, and if you thro flow, throw in geopolitically also that, and I think less of a concern is uh, Ukraine, Putin, uh, or China. Well, well, before, and more, if I may, before we go to you, before yeah. we go to Ukraine and China, we've talked about trying to keep the Conservative Party together. Um, she has a United yeah. Kingdom to try to keep together. What with uh, a fresh independence moves out of Scotland and uh, a lot of jousting over what happens next in Northern Ireland. And she's very worried uh, that uh, if uh, Northern Ireland does unite. Uh, that Scotland will go next. And um, if the EU uh, starts making overtures, I mean, how difficult exactly does uh, the EU want to be to, 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 to London? Uh, but the integrity of the United Kingdom is clearly in question. Um, Paul Jake said there about the need to undo what Tony Blair did. It will be difficult, and the act of trying to undo that might actually... Uh, have the opposite effect, which is to make Scotland even more determined to have its um, its own independence. I think it is simply a matter of time before Ireland unifies, before 1801. Uh, Ireland was a separate country before 1603 and 1707. Scotland was a separate country. They are destined to go uh, their own way again. Uh, and uh, when... Uh, listeners, viewers, travel to Scotland, you feel uh, increasingly that it's a different country. Economically, it's going to be a tough uh, task for it. But, you know, those are real tasks. I mean, you're adding all this in, and it's a difficult inheritance, and there's no money in the bank to spend without borrowing, uh, but there's an awful lot to spend it on. And very importantly, your uh, party doesn't agree uh, with the medicine. There are two very distinct uh, medicines on offer to heal. Everyone agrees the patient on the table is seriously uh, ill, uh, but no one agrees on exactly what to do about it. Difficult. It is difficult. The incoming prime minister doubling down, we said, on the issue of cutting taxes. She's also suggesting an extension of uh, strike notices uh, that unions would have to uh, put those strike notices in for four weeks instead of two. That would give companies more time to find uh, temp workers. Uh, the Times uh, uh, of London 
uh, quoting uh, Liz Truss as saying, quote, we need to get t- t- we need tough and decisive action to limit trade unions ability to paralyze our economy. Uh, your, your, your thoughts on on uh, Katzin Fieschi, again, I'm sorry to get back to this, but this kind of this sort of Thatcherite rhetoric. I was going to say, I mean, it's very, very hard not to hear, you know, echoes uh, of the of the 1980s. And yet you, you hear Anthony <laughs> Selden saying she needs to find her own voice. What she, is her own voice? She Well, she definitely needs to find it. I, I completely agree. I think so far she has... Uh, you know, been incapable of doing so. Um, I think she's she's felt stuck between you know the 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 shadow of, of of Boris Johnson and you know the what's on offer in 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 the party. But I think that one of the things that seems you know really um, crucial to me going forward about what she chooses to do is she seems to be willing to gamble on the UK's most important relationships. So she seems to be willing to take a gamble uh, with the EU uh, and, and essentially, you know, pursue uh, the the road to calling into... A gambler? Is she a gambler the way David Cameron was a gambler? He gambled and won with the Scotland referendum and, and then, of course, came the Brexit one. I, I'm, I don't know whether she thinks she's a gambler. I think she is gambling. I think she thinks that, you know, she's shaking up, uh, you know, she's shaking up the, 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 the nation and trying, you know, to wake... Uh, to, to, to wake up some of the instincts that potentially have been, you know, become dormant in this in this crisis and in this long transition of, of power. She's also willing, it seems to me, which I think is, you know, definitely a break from uh, from Thatcherism. She seems to be willing to take a gamble even on her relationship with the U.S. Uh, because she knows very, very well that, you know, her uh, her attitude toward the Northern Ireland protocol uh, may really displease uh, Biden. But, you know, she seems to also be willing to take a gamble on that. So my sense is that, and and this is, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, supposition on my part, is that she's trying to find her voice by taking all sorts of risks. And she wants to see kind of, you know, who she rallies, who she alienates, uh, you know, where the chips fall, and then potentially build from there. Jake Scott, that sounds more like David Cameron and Boris Johnson than Margaret Thatcher, the woman that Catherine Fieschi just described. I think talking about Cameron very briefly, Cameron's goal as prime minister was to settle the great questions of this country, which was what is our economy going to look like, which he largely settled. What is our relationship internally going to look like in terms of devolution, which again, I think he thinks he settled, but didn't really. And the last was our relationship to Europe, which he he lost on. Um, There's another constitutional question that people are really scared to talk about, and it's what's going to happen when Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth passes away, because that is going to be soon. And it may very well be within this parliament. And that will raise serious constitutional questions. Republicans are going to come out of the woodwork, one of whom used to be in the Liberal Democrat Party and is now our Prime Minister. So is Liz Truss going to be able to, as Anthony Selden had said, hold the country together, uh, as as Catherine said, keep our relationship with foreign partners, but there's a sort of deeper question, which is the actual British constitution. Is she going to defend the institution of monarchy, which once she professed to really dislike? And again, I have to come back to my point at the beginning of the show, I'm not convinced of her political conversion to conservatism, and I really don't think that she's a monarchist and is going to defend the institution of monarchy. So actually, again, I don't think she's going to be able to defend this country in any capacity. Anthony Selden, a, a, a word on this. Fine. Well, I, it's, that's, I mean, that's a really serious point, and it's obviously a counterfactual because she's still alive, but uh, she can't live for much longer, and it would be have been very helpful to Britain to have had a, a, a Tony Blair uh, um, or a, a John Major, a, a, a figure um, with that ability uh, and conviction about the monarchy, um, or Tony Blair's ability to to speak to the whole nation, uh, John Major's deep connection with the monarchy and with with the country, uh, it will be difficult for her, and it will seriously unpick um, even more what it is that holds the United Kingdom together. I mean, listeners mustn't, viewers mustn't think the United Kingdom is a, a given for all time. It's not like uh, France, um, and on top of that. Uh, abroad, Britain's post-war position uh, in the world has depended upon the special relationship or a special relationship, it's come and gone, 
uh, but it's always been there, with the United States. And that now is very much in question uh, with the two twin leaders of America, uh, Donald Trump, uh, having no time uh, for Britain and Biden because of, uh, I mean, a weak president, uh, but partly because of the Northern Ireland position. Again, no time for a special position. So Britain is too small to punch uh, above our weight. We talk big in Ukraine, but what the heck uh, does it mean? Uh, we talk about putting up defence spending, but that's going to have to come out of education or, it's, or out of health, and neither of those are attractive. So um, she ought to be careful what she wishes for and who she offends. And it was extraordinarily foolish uh, of her. I take Jake's point that she is, I'm sure, posturing to try and find uh, her own ground. Uh, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if when, uh, after she kisses hands with the monarch tomorrow becomes officially prime minister, uh, she is beating a door to the Elysee uh, and Germany and actually uh, building those relationships because her premiership will need to have uh, allies. Britain can no longer stand uh, in the world as a force for good. It, it, it's just rhetoric. It's meaningless. All right. And we'll, of course, be uh, on the lookout for uh, the first arrival of uh, Liz Truss here to Paris uh, as a new UK uh, prime minister. First, as Anthony says, uh, there will be that trip to Balmoral to visit uh, the monarch on Tuesday uh, to be anointed as uh, um, Queen Elizabeth's 15th prime minister. I want to thank you, Anthony Selden, uh, for joining us uh, from Windsor. Uh, Jake Scott in Birmingham. Catherine Fieschi, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.